Thank you so much to uh, Jan for the invitation. Um, my, my formal training is in uh, political theory and international human rights law. And when I, when I first started to think more concertedly about uh, European Union law, Jan was a, a very generous uh, mentor and, and friend. And so I really appreciate uh, the invitation and the chance to present uh, this paper before you all. The, the paper is really inspired by a certain uh, normative vision of the European Union. Uh, that, is, that is not reducible uh, to either the opportunities of a single market uh, or kind of visions of political liberalism or even a kind of a peace building project, but something a little bit more normatively, normatively demanding that takes seriously the kind of um, the, the pluralism uh, embedded within a certain kind of way of understanding reflexively our own polities. So the idea behind the EU in some ways is about this ambition to have mutual learning, uh, reflexive exchange, a somewhat self-critical and more self-critical positioning vis-a-vis uh, -vis our own polities as the basic underlying normative ambition uh, of the project. Uh, and in, it's, it's in some ways that deep awareness of pluralism, in the, in the words of Arendt, if you forgive the, the gendered um, uh, formulation, that, that men, not man, uh, live on earth and inhabit the world. And it's, of course, informed a lot by, by theories of democracy, uh, theories of, of supranationalism and constitutional tolerance. I'm trying to kind of think more deeply about what it means in terms of legal reasoning to give voice to that high level of reflexivity uh, that a polity should embrace as part of the European project, part of its participation in the European project. So how do we really understand the reflexivity of law in a deeply plural legal order? One way that I think is, is, is quite common is to say that we have uh, a gradation from legality to legitimacy to justification. And that's the way that we actually achieve some kind of reflexivity in law. And in some ways, that works insofar um, as we have a fairly uh, common understanding of what those moral justifications, what the meaning of those moral principles actually is. But I think if we take that pluralism seriously, if we take reflexivity seriously, we have to have a little bit of doubt that we actually know what the content of those moral principles actually is. And so that reflexivity actually actually even apply to that process of justification itself. And so we want to kind of understand reflexivity a little bit dif uh, differently. Um, I think that revision starts for me embracing kind of the framing that Jan gave us of peering into the imaginaries of constitutional law a little bit more deeply. Uh, there's a sense that constitutionalism names not only a system of principles or rules, um, but a deep kind of way of looking at the world, of making sense of the world, of imparting sense to the world. And that actually those imaginaries are plural themselves. And so if we take that pluralism of imaginaries to run all the way down, we have a, a more, a, I think a richer and more demanding picture of reflexivity in law as well. That these imaginaries in some ways structure political psychologies, they structure the sociologies of law, they structure sort of temporal orientations of citizens to law, they structure how we think about what agency means and who are the agents of politics under constitutional legal orders. And again, that kind of pluralism is important to think about as we understand what the reflexive ambitions are of a pluralistic legal order. So there's really three parts of the paper. The first uh, is, is to articulate a topology of constitutional imaginaries. Here I label them history, system, and principle. These are, of course, stylized. They're ideal types. They're exaggerations that hopefully have, because of their exaggerations, some kind of analytic value. The second part of the paper takes that analytic value and develops a certain kind of diagnosis that these three uh, legal imaginaries that I think are present in EU law in some ways exhibit a, an underlying tendency towards coherence, a still a kind of an investment in the mastery of law that really denies the, the heart of constitutional reflexivity. And then the third part of the paper moves into uh, a fourth imaginary that I think is responsive to that dilemma that I call analogy. Um, and then I, I conclude uh, the paper with an example that this is not just some kind of fanciful imagination of, of what, uh, uh, what the final imaginary might be, but actually it's, we do find it in strands of existing jurisprudence in EU law. So let me go very quickly through those three parts. The topology begins with, with history. And history latches on to the idea of citizenship in a bounded political community where citizens author a political project over time and that law is meant to carry forth that project over time so that law cares about in some part conservation that it's supposed to preserve the political agency of citizens over time drawing back to some originary constitutional moment it could be founding but, but really broad moments of political mobilization that are only possible because you have some kind of discrete bounded community. This is the political psychology of will in Paul Kahn's uh, schema. In European Union law, you find this, I think, most 
emblematically in the jurisprudence of the German Federal Constitutional Court and the way that it's articulated <laughs> its constitutional agenda jur jurisprudence and other ways to push back on the transfer of competencies to the Union. There's, of course, a lot to say, but the, the idea here is that um, the, the, the ambition of the, of the uh, history imaginary in terms of, of post-national law is a kind of parochial perspective. So the German Federal Constitutional Court in some sense defends certain kinds of post-national principles, certain kinds of fundamental rights, but it always does so from a particular embedded perspective. And so when it defends the values of democracy, it defends the first and foremost the values of democracy as they are interpreted by the German uh, basic law. And I think that in this imaginary, what's lost is the capacity of courts, uh, judging from this perspective of, of history, to understand how the values uh, that might be embedded in one system are actually playing themselves out in other jurisdictions. So famously in, in the OMT saga, but really in most of this jurisprudence, there's an inability of the German Federal Constitutional Court to really take seriously that the defense of democracy in Germany might come at the expense of democracy elsewhere, in Spain, in Portugal, in Greece. This has led uh, people like Bruce Ackerman, and we'll hear about this from Cigna as well later, that the idea that there's a certain kind of path dependency in constitutionalism, that the, the histories of revolutionary moments lead us to have certain embedded understandings of what these values are, and that it actually becomes a very delicate process of then resolving systemically shared problems in a broad post-national way because we're constantly carrying that baggage of the, the memory of that particular historical imaginary. The second imaginary is one of system. And here, the, the key agent is not the individual citizen, but it's really the individual desi uh, uh, described as, as a consumer. And we, we achieve a certain kind of post-national equality insofar as we are all possible individual consumers that we have a capacity for choice. And what we crave here uh, is not the continuation of a certain political project, but we, we crave the ordered liberty uh, and the, the predictability of the law of contract. Um, here, the, the emphasis is not on discovering the interpretations of various deeply held public norms, but it's about having some kind of coordination of the consequences of action. So this is, of course, uh, and I'm sure that Yezi will, will correct the kind of very uh, superficial reading, but this is kind of indebted by uh, it's, it's a systems theory. And Habermas has this wonderful uh, criticism of systems theory that really understands uh, law from the perspective of the social scientists and that understands um, law to kind of occur behind the backs of citizens in some ways. And so citizens become stakeholders here. Uh, the, it, it becomes the domain of interest. Uh, what we care about is the efficacy with which uh, the system can deliver certain goods but not necessarily the meaning of what those goods actually signify as, 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 as markers of certain kinds of shared norms and shared, belong, shared structures of belonging. So here politics actually becomes in some ways a distrusted form of action. It could always distort the effective uh, distribution of goods that the system is supposed to deliver. And that what we care about in some ways is not the inter intervention of democratic majorities, but what we care about is the, the stabilization on the part of uh, technocrats. So that there's a high premium placed on expertise and that courts basically assume this kind of maintain, maintenance uh, role as expert interveners to make sure that the system funct functions effectively. You see this, of course, this is the kind of standard story told of the, about the functionalism of the European Court of Justice and specifically about the kind of reasoning that we often find that's very cursory, that's meant in some ways simply to, to give very clear instruction to other European courts. And what we really care about is that that instruction is clear as opposed to it's, that it's rich in terms of its normative interpretations. Um, this is a kind of a very questionable interpretation that's given to what the court does, but I think it does capture something about the, the imaginary, what the, what the court's imagining itself to be doing. The third imaginary is principle. Here, principle signifies post-national equality through the shared humanity of all persons. So we're not just consumers, we're able to reason together, we're able to, be able to construct certain kinds of context transcending claims. This is the, the classic uh, domain of Habermasian discourse theory. And through that uh, context transcendence, we're able to reconstruct a system of, of rights. Uh, and so citizens in some ways are first and foremost rights bearers. That we can reduce the, what, what citizens deserve in the public sphere by what rights attach to them. And that move is really kind of predicated upon a certain kind of abstraction away from the lived experience of citizens. In some ways, that lived experience always threatens to kind of um, to poison the moral purity of, of the reasons that we give to one another. And so it's always viewed with a little bit of skepticism. 
the concern here is that you're always going to depart too quickly from the, the very foundations of lived experience that actually give you meaning, that you can actually in interpret the world through. And so there's a certain kind of worry that there uh, is an increasingly an emerging gap between principle and the transformational post-national politics. And so you hear, um, here I think we can think of uh, various kind of, uh, interpretations of fundamental rights jurisprudence in, in the European context. So when the European Court of Justice applies the, the charter or tries to interpret the, the provisions of the charter by drawing on different traditions with regards to, to national constitutional law, it does so often with a very questionable methodology of comparative constitutional law. It doesn't quite define with any real uh, rigor what those shared values actually are, and so it kind of skips over the surface of these values. So again, this kind of this, this abstraction, this dis distancing away from concrete interpretations of value, this kind of shortcut to justification. Okay, so where does that topology leave us? The key pivot in the paper is trying to point to the, the need to go beyond coherence, which each of these, uh, each of these imaginaries have a certain kind of understanding of utopia. Right, the, the kinds of privileging of the, uh, of the different forms of psychology and, and citizenship and uh, agency that I just mentioned, what they're less aware of is the way that that utopia slips into ideology. So the way that that utopia slips into to, um, conceal other competing ways of imagining post-national membership. What I think we need is this kind of trans uh, this, this shift from coherence to, to an expectation of law's intelligibility. So the, the perception of law, how it changes in time, precisely at that fulcrum of, um, of, of a utopia to analogy. Here I, I turn to uh, an American constitutional theorist, Robert Cover, to think about law's temporality. Cover's work, I think, is incredibly useful here because he explicitly speaks about law as a narrative structure. The way that we express commitment to law is through narrative claims and the stories that we actually are able to tell through law. It's a, it's a deep reorientation of memory within law as well. Um, here I, I kind of uh, have a, uh, an indebtedness to, to a literary strand of uh, Karlova Knausgaard uh, in the sense of trying to slow down time, that the more we slow down time, we're actually more attuned uh, to the ways that we're mutually inter interdependent, that our control of the, over the present is never uh, sovereign. And that the, the formulation of attachment in Knausgaard's work is in some ways really profound because it takes seriously this fidelity to the reflexivity of attachment. So to conceive of law in this narrative form is I think reformulating and repositioning something quite profound about what we do when we as citizens or as judges engage in adjudication or lawmaking. We are always coming from legal traditions that have a plural set of genealogies. In the present moment, we are selecting certain kinds of law to apply that are persuasive to us. And we're always anticipating different reinterpretations of law into the future. I, I know that I'm, I'm just about out of time. The, the example that I give in the paper of this kind of analogical reasoning, I, the an analogy for me is precisely the way that uh, this temporal dynamic of law is inscribed within law. The, the, the case that I mentioned here is X and X versus Belgium. Uh, this was a case uh, of a family seeking uh, a humanitarian visa to travel to Belgium that was denied by the European Court of Justice, but there was a, a, an advisory opinion given by uh, Advocate General Mangozzi that I think is, is remarkable for the way that embraces this kind of temporal understanding of time. I won't go into the, the different dimensions, but he does stress this kind of diachronic interpretation that he, that he gives to the law. He uses uh, an, an analogy quite frequently. He orients citizens and, communi and communities vis-a-vis -vis one another in quite creative ways. He, uh, the, the, the passage that I want to quote by, by way of closing is his comparison of the potential within European Union law to actually serve a, a, a fundamental rights protecting role in ways that the European Convention on Human Rights does not. So he's looking around to different bodies of law to see how they, they dynamically interweave and interact over time. And he's finding ways for um, a better way to understand the, the imaginative possibilities in law. So here, this is a, a paragraph that, he, that particularly st struck me as, as worthwhile in thinking about the narrative analogical structure of law. So this is, uh, this is him uh, writing, <coughs> one thing that struck me while rereading the case law of the European Court of Human Rights for the purposes of dealing with the present case, the findings of that court relating to the situations, always horrible and tragic, are findings made ex post most often where the treatment in question has been fatal for the victims. On the contrary, in the present case, 
All hope for the applicants has not thus far been lost. The proposal that I have just submitted to the court demonstrates indeed that there is a humanitarian path within the framework of the EU law, which requires member states to prevent manifest infringements of the absolute rights of persons seeking international protection before it is too late. <coughs> so this, going back to this kind of hinge between utopia and ideology, that the, the sensitivity to the ways that utopian projections always slip into ideology, is precisely this idea of law always coming in too late. Uh, the sensitivity to that moment, I think, opens up a, a way of understanding a defense of post-nationality that isn't simply an, an abstraction. Uh, it's not a, a way of understanding um, certain kind of uh, uh, interpretations of principle. He, do, he specifically does not simply rely on human rights understandings. He does much more interpretive work in the opinion. It's a, it's, he's grappling with the limitations of current case law, the way that, that, that the case law could have been interpreted differently, and he's trying to be sensitive to the ways that we can imagine uh, case law moving forward to tell a different story. And so uh, I think that's the dynamic in law that I think we should be sensitive to that's more responsive to the reflexivity in law uh, that I ultimately I think is the great ambition uh, of European constitutionalism. Thank you. Fantastic. <laughs> so we, on that note, um, we open for questions. I'm sorry to, to rush through that a little <laughs> bit. Amnon's presence was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks, thanks very much. It's a great um, presentation. And I, I like your, I'm looking at your table. Yeah, which I should have probably put it up on the. Uh, uh, <coughs> analyzes these three kind of world views, um, history, system, and principle. Uh, I'm wondering if you can expand a little bit on your, sort of, I think you critique them quite nicely. But, um, and you suggest uh, an alternative the second table has it. Oh, a little I missed bit, yeah, the yeah. second table. Where's the second table? It's uh, 31. 31, yeah. But I'm sure that won't answer your question, so please. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, no, well, okay, so it, so it kind of does, um, to some extent. But um, I'm happy to go through that a little bit more detail, because I skipped over that very quickly in the presentation. So. Yeah, because you, get, so you gave us the, the fourth through a, a nice romantic yeah. story of a, of, a, of a particular case. Um, but I'm wondering if you, yeah, maybe you could explain quite how that could be a, uh, a substitute for, for the three in a little bit more detail. Yeah. So, uh, so no, 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 take other questions? Or? No, no, I'm just looking and just yeah. canvassing the room. So w one thing that I, I hope that the kind of analytical uptake of the, the first table you mentioned is to understand the segmentation. Uh, of the different, uh, A, the different temporalities. I think that's what jumps out at me in, in some ways the most. Um, so the, 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 the worry is that when you have the existing three, the first three imaginaries, and their investment in co the coherence of law, uh, what you have is a set of imaginaries that run parallel to one another, that, that sometimes intersect, but ultimately are uh, prone to a certain kind of fragmentation. Uh, and so there is, is less of an opportunity for mutual learning across these different imaginaries. In the paper, I give the example of European citizenship law. And so you often have uh, this, this kind of sense that, that the expansion of the European, the protections of European citizenship, of course, began with, with very uh, minimal economic understandings and slowly have, has, have been, has been liberated from that merely economic perspective. And yet, what you have, if you, if you view those three different worldviews, as you said, you see that nation states in response to that liberation of European citizenship from the narrow economic model, have many of them have actually increasingly relied on more insular, culturally based understandings of, of, of immigration policy, of naturalization policy. So they've in some ways pulled up the ramparts of this historical imaginary in response to these different other imaginaries operating within European citizenship law. So the, the idea is here is that they're, they're primed in some ways to a certain kind of, of uh, ideological segmentation. What I want to pull out from in terms of the, the, the fourth imaginary is to seek out ways to speak across these previous three. Uh, in terms of the temporality, I think that this means actually making sense of how law can move uh, citizens from past through present into future. Um, the, the, the key kind of component there is, is this idea of interpretation. And if you take the, the work of interpretation seriously, uh, it means that you're, you're inheriting certain kinds of norms, and, you're, and these norms are always overdetermined in their meaning. Um, so Cover has this wonderful uh, uh, point when he makes the, 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 he, you know, he's, of course, he's a critical legal thinker, but he thinks that, that there, there are all these modern apologists for law that say that the, the hardest part about law is its indeterminacy, um, that we don't have enough law to tell us where to go to judge. And he thinks that that gets the point exactly backwards. Uh, 
It's not that we don't have enough laws, that we have too much law. And that if, if judges perceive their role as to clarify the law, uh, to, to actually say, here's, here's what we have to decide the law is, they're actually um, foreclosing all sorts of imaginative possibilities, actually ignoring the superfluity of the material resources that we have to interpret the law. So part of, of taking interpretation and the inheritance of interpretation seriously is this idea that we have a very rich inheritance uh, of, of law that can, that can inspire us, that there's always a genealogy of how these norms came to be, where things could have been differently done. Um, and then you're also projecting a certain kind of decision into the future that will then have to be in anticipation being picked up by other courts, by other actors. And so you're always trying to put in your opinion uh, examples of, of, of your own humility in terms of understanding that this judgment that I as a judge or as, even as a citizen making is fairly discreet. It's rooted in this particular moment, the exigencies of the present case, such that in a, a different case that has a different factual pattern that, that asks me to think about different connections within that um, overdetermined law might, might point in different directions. And so there's this kind of anticipation towards the future that's building on a plural inherited past. And I think that, that the work of analogy is precisely the way that we can, we can think about that work. Not sure if that, that answers, uh, but, but thank you for giving me a chance to, to develop that a little bit. Sorry, Jihan. Is that next up? Yeah, it's going to be relatively short, and uh, it concerns the questions of who is concerned with these imaginaries. So you talk of them as legal imaginaries, mm -hmm. and um, most of the time it seems to me that it's about lawyers or legal institutions which uh, somewhat uh, use their imaginaries in the way to solve problems. And I wonder, because when I go through these four different kinds of imaginary, then I can understand that uh, someone who stands outside the legal system, like as the addressee of the law, the citizens, mm. can quite well get what the historical narrative or imaginary is, the system narrative, as you call it, and the principled narrative, so citizen as a right bearer. But the fourth one is quite complex. And I think it might have to do with uh, because you just mentioned Paul Kahn, but uh, I think it's also quite related to the cultural study of law and the yeah. question, so who is you concerned with? Is it the legal professionals and their narratives, or is it like ordinary people, the addressees of the law? So do you see yeah. a problem between like the level of abstraction or complexity of the three narratives or imaginaries and the imaginary as analogy, which is, I think, at a very different level of complexity? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the ambition here is to think about ways to, to reduce the, the, the gap between law and politics in some ways. Um, and I, I do think that uh, there's a way that we can reconstruct the imaginaries uh, in, in quite complex ways using the categories of you know, social science or political theory. I, I do think that these are ultimately lived imaginaries, that they're embedded in the ways that, that um, individuals engage with courts uh, imagine their rights, uh, imagine interactions with one another. Um, I think that, uh, and, and certainly that's true for the three. Now, you seem to be saying that the, kind of the fourth one is a little bit more, more complex, and I think it is more demanding on the citizen. I think it, it is tracking uh, a reorientation on the part of the citizen in, of, of his or her relationship with the polity. Uh, and to, to be, become aware slowly, I think, of the different interdependencies that exist, not just between the citizens of one polity, but on, on different levels in this kind of democratic kind of understanding. Um, I think that the way you get there, though, is by being more attuned uh, to the ways that law is, is expresses a certain kind of story of, of these particular conflicts, of the, of the inherited uh, histories of, of different polities, of the different projections of uh, idealized futures. And I actually think that, uh, that if, if judges were to, if judges and political commentators and, and public commentators were to um, tell a little bit more of, of about these interpretations of law, um, it would actually en enable citizens to engage with these more, 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 uh, more intelligible kind of principles as opposed to these kind of more easily accessible uh, understandings of coherence. You know, I think, I think that that's, these are all things that we've inherited fairly, it's fairly easy to understand who we are as consumers or having certain kinds of lists of rights. It's harder to understand ourselves as having, having rights, but that those rights are always fluid on some level and that we have to actually fight for them and that they are born out of struggle. It's actually a difficult and demanding thing to understand, but actually, I think that's the only, uh, it's, it's difficult, but it's the only commitment to law that is open for us to have, actually. That everything else is kind of a, a, a dry, sedimented picture of law that actually is ideological, ultimately, and that it robs us in some ways of, of real political agency. So it might be easier to understand, it might be less complex, we might inherit it fairly straightforwardly, 
but actually it's not the kind of politics that is really transformative. Um, and so yeah, I, th I think it is more complex, but I think that uh, f starting with the courts, the high courts, you know, the, it's, it's impressive to me, th the reason why I picked the, the Mengozi opinion, I think it speaks to me uh, a lot, but also I think uh, it, was, it was covered very well, in the, certainly in the Belgian press. Uh, it inspired conversation. Um, it, the way that it made its claims actually made a difference for how the judgment was, was picked up in the broader public sphere. In, in, in ways that the other kinds of forms of expressing public value may not be. Um, and so I think that's the gamble here. There's a way that you can express claims to constitutional rights or claims to constitutional provisions that open it themselves up more to public contestation, to being picked up in the public sphere in ways that promote this kind of reflexive understanding of citizens to their own public lives. Thank you very much, Paul. It was fascinating and I loved the paper so much. And now with your comment on that uh, imaginaries as lived experiences, uh, yes, it is all back to Habermasism, <laughs> yeah, it's despite uh, the systemic talk. And uh, um, my question is actually about, uh, yes, you, you distinguish between lived experiences and uh, systems theory and uh, um, uh, at the same time, you point that um, imaginaries provide for coherence. Is coherence lived experience? Is it something which citizens as agents uh, long for? Or is coherence already something which is required internally by the system of law to operate, to function? So for me, the question is, are these imaginaries actually serving functional rationality of law, this is something to do with the question that uh, Jan asked. Hmm. Who is it for? Do lawyers need coherence? Of course they need. Yeah, they, they need to operate within certain logical coherence. <coughs> yeah. Or uh, do citizens need coherence system? Or do they need something which is beyond coherence, which yeah. is much more, I hate that word, but we are in Copenhagen, we can afford it, existential need. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, on, on, on the thank you for that comment. I, I mean, the, the, on the on the legal level, uh, yes. I mean, I think that there is. A, I, I I I fully kind of take on board that all the the traditional uh, kind of commonplaces, I guess, of of law and legal and what the, the the basic functions of law, especially at you know at the trial court level, for example, of predictability and certainty, this un, this destabilizes those uh, to some extent. Um, my my sense though is that uh, those are always artificial. Um, Kind of, those are always imagined and artificial, right? They're, they're actually not uh, there to be found in law. The law is projecting those, and all that intelligibility is doing is 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 is, for, is, is, is narrowing the kind of the time horizon of, of how certainty acts. Um, and so it's it's telling it's 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 basically the, the the idea here is that we can still have certainty within law. It's just over a longer time horizon or an increased time horizon that we're able to understand how coherence goes to other coherence, to other coherence. So we are able to make the shift. Um, so it's not an ideology of co uh, coherence in the sense that this is a, a fully enclosed, self-reproducing system that, that, is, that is in some ways uh, immune um, to, uh, that we imagine it to be always there and always already available to us, but that we can actually understand the ways that it always has these frayed edges. So at any one point in time, we can reconstruct the coherence of the system. But our ambition is not to presume that then that determines the, the, pa the, the future or it speaks for the, the past. And so there's a sense that even as we reason from these materials, so I think that the reason why analogical reasoning for me is useful here is that when we reason as, as lawyers through analogy, we're actually we're making a coherent claim. right? The, the, the analogies have to be persuasive. And I think that that tracks in some ways whether they, they reconstruct a coherent picture of what the law can tell us. But it doesn't actually mean that there's a presumption of coherence across time. Um, that that we're, we're leaving the possibilities of differential interpretations from the past or differential anticipations in the future still open. And being aware of that, I think, is really important, even from the internal point of view. To your deeper question about this existential need, and this is a political theological question on some level, I, I think I'm inspired by the kind of move of deconstruction to take seriously that, that this, this desire for existential meaning and this, this desire for coherence in that broader temporal horizon is, is, is in, we're, asking, um, we're asking our polities and one another to lie about 
the real nature of things. Um, that that's a, that's a fabrication, just as the coherence of law is a fabrication. And that if we're really serious about um, taking our obligations to one another seriously, we shouldn't reach for this kind of existential answer. That really the, what the, the nature of existence is being thrown in time in this way. And so the, the, this, the reason why Knausgaard is, is a really powerful example of this is because he does have a, a kind of secular faith. Um, it, it's not embedded in a kind of existential certainty. It's, it's, it's uh, embedded in a certain kind of, uh, of, of sensitivity to the passing of time, the way that the present is always ceasing to be. And I think that there's a kind of a maturity in some ways to experiencing the existential bonds to one another through that lens, as opposed to a deep kind of existential um, ideological lens that, se that seeks certainty from, from, from without in that way. And that's, again, it's, it's an incredibly demanding but it's, uh, I'll stop here, maybe I can, maybe I'd love to hear your question. Uh, there's actually somebody else on. Oh, I'm sorry, so, yeah. Uh, I, we are fast running out of time. I'm striking myself off the, uh, the list. I have uh, something I'd be very interested to hear speak about. But uh, last question is for uh, Calypso. Um, well, very quickly, fascinating, fascinating paper. And I just want to be very uh, pedestrian here. And in a way, ask about the status of your analog analogical reasoning. Uh, because I think in the paper you do two things, or maybe you hesitate between two approaches and speak to the project as a whole. Is it a fourth kind of superior, more complex, more appropriate, more democratic understanding, self-reflective, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, or is it a horizontal kind of take uh, on well what you present as the other three, providing the kind of imaginary glue, which you could say, you know, could reconcile the, the other three, but it's not what we're after, not reconciling the other three. It's also, you know, transcending them and, and, and all of that, um, um, and destabilizing them in various ways. Hmm. But it doesn't have, the, to me, when I read the paper, it doesn't have the status of a fourth column, hmm. as, it, as it were. And I wonder if you couldn't, um, and, and, and therefore, the status that we're seeking for the imagi imaginary dimension, uh, you know, is kind of underplayed if, if you just put it as this kind of fourth competing one. So, can yeah. you clarify that? No, it's a really helpful ambiguity, and I and I guess I partially because I think that the fourth comes from a certain kind of analytic uh, usefulness of the first three. It's responding to something that we see in the first three. It is in some ways derivative, um, and so it can be repackaged into understanding how. Even in the, t in the zone of temporality, if if analogical reasoning is supposed to be across past, present, future, on some level it has to make use of those preceding three imaginaries, and so you might have analogical reason that that occupies at different points in time the perspectives of history or the perspectives of systemic contract to make its claims. I, I do think that so I think in some ways you can uh, you can actually imagine the, the, the analogical form as a broader. Um, kind of uh, genus of those of those three different species, one that is sensitive to the limitations of each, and actually foregrounds that each of those are limited in certain kinds of very pronounced ways, and makes that limitation explicit. And for that reason, is in my view more conducive to see self a full, fully transformational uh, self reflexivity. I do think though that there is value to thinking about it as a as a self standing uh, imaginary, uh, in so in so far as. Um, the, the, uh, the idea of authorship in this particular way that I think in, in response to the kind of existential demands of, of citizenship, it does, it, do, it does ask you to give up on, on certain kinds of understandings of citizenship that are, are, are more insular, or uh, certain understandings of contract that are more limited, or certain understandings of principle that are too abstract. And I think that there is a way that you actually do depart from those understandings. It is, it is a self-standing way of, of making claims in the world that rests ultimately on persuasion, as opposed to uh, history or morality or, or eff efficiency. And I, I don't think you can reduce persuasion or parcel it out to merely those other three. I think persuasion has its own kind of standing that deserves to be isolated and, and kind of deepened uh, on its own.